Hey everybody, how you all doing this morning? Thanks for being here. 9.30, it's a tough one on a Monday morning, right? But you guys meet regularly at this time anyway, right? Anyway, good to see you. Thanks for coming today. Uh, welcome to the uh, School of Business, Government and Economics uh, Dean Speaker Series. And uh, we're just delighted this morning to have uh, Heather Ratcliffe as our speaker from T-Mobile. Anyone been to T-Mobile Park yet this year? Hey, we've got a few baseball fans, yeah? Yeah, make sure get everyone your ticket. Yeah. <laughs> and you've seen the lovely new magenta all across the park, right? Apparently it's magenta and not pink. Correct. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but T-Mobile is a, uh, well, it's, it's becoming an industry leader, quite frankly, in the telecommunications space after being a follower probably early on in its uh, development, and now it's becoming more of a leader, and of course there's a lot, a lot of things that we might hear from Heather about in terms of the Sprint merger that's happening and things of that nature, and going to 5G, and it's a very interesting cutting edge company. But let me tell you a little bit about Heather and why we're so delighted to have her here today. And if you're interested in questions around what does it mean to be human in a world of artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning, you know, what are the values that we should use to check algorithms that kind of might feed us data? How does, uh, how does machine learning and AI enhance the customer experience and the employee experience? These are really interesting questions and questions that our school really wants to wrestle with because of the ethical framework that we bring as a Christian institution to, uh, to, to these questions. And so um, Heather's going to be talking to, a, to us a little bit about that today. She works at kind of the intersection of technology and diversity and the impact of algorithms on uh, around bias and that kind of thing. Um, Heather works as the director or director within the product and technology organization of T-Mobile USA. Uh, she uh, is very interested in privacy and uh, works with the privacy and preference product team that's responsible for delivering uh, privacy experiences that protect personal information disrupt the market, and it, as it says here, delights the customer. She is responsible for leading the company's response to the California Consumer Privacy Act. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm really interested in this whole idea of privacy, privacy of information. Um, Heather has, numerous, has had numerous leadership roles within T-Mobile, and then prior to that at startup. She holds an MBA with a focus in technology management from the University of Phoenix and a BA from the University of Washington. She strongly believes in servant leadership and she serves as the chair of the T-Mobile Headquarter Diversity and Inclusion Chapter. So it's really uh, a privilege for me today to hand over to Heather uh, to talk to you and just welcome you here. Heather. Thanks so much for coming today. All right, Let's give thank her a you. All right, thank you for having me. Super excited to be here today again on a Monday morning, 9.30, the day after Cinco de Mayo, but I'll leave it there. <laughs> and so a couple things today before we jump in. I will not be talking at you, but talking with you. So it's gonna be a little bit interactive. So I need your engagement, need to feed off of your energy here. I know it's Monday morning, but I promise you we'll have some fun, exciting things to talk about today. Disclaimer, by no means am I a professor or proclaim to be one, but today I just want to talk to you from an industry standpoint of how T-Mobile is using AI um, along with my passion and love around diversity and inclusion and again that intersectionality between that. Um, and as you guys can all read the topic around that, again, it's going to be how to address bias in algorithms and really we are coming into an age where Algorithms, artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning are truly driving the next evolution of the products we consume or how we even interact with each other. So it then becomes important that we remove those biases so that they're no longer negotiable. So I know my bio was read, but I thought, you know, let me give you a little bit of personal who is Heather, some fun facts about me. So if we move forward, okay, that's little Heather right there. Why this picture? I picked this picture, one, because it takes me to a place of when life was just so great. <laughs> we didn't have the worries of the world. 
every day was a good day. It felt like every day was sunshine. All I could think about is going to Playland at McDonald's. So that's my picture to make sure I'm not nervous. So I just look at that picture. <laughs> but those are a little insights to get about me. Um, also, what do you want to learn about me today? A couple things. I'm a connoisseur of old school hip hop. That just means I'm a really big fan. So some of my favorite groups are De La So. I don't know if you guys may have heard them. So again, they saved my life. No. <laughs> and Tribe Called Quest. <laughs> Again, my leadership philosophy, interesting enough, I'm glad to be at SPAU, being a Christian-based school, is really around servant leadership. It's a really around, and you know, you may hear that as a buzzword these days, but it's really about putting those, putting others before yourself. Wanting to see the success of the organization and your team before others. And what really got me there was, you know, my first experience, first job out of college, and I was surrounded about or around all these older folks working for uh, city of Tacoma. And I thought they were older. They looked like my parents' age or something at that time. But the way they embraced me and wanted to ensure I was set up for success. And so again, I realized right there the importance of they put their selves aside to make sure that I was successful. And it very much relates to even if you want to base that on Christian values, when Jesus took the time to wash the feet of his disciples. So again, we can use those in all our aspects of life. You don't have to lose your integrity and your beliefs and your foundations just because you're sitting in a corporate world. Um, also with that, by having that leadership philosophy, I really ground myself in making sure with my team, I lead a team of 23 folks, of having a shared vision, making sure everyone has something they can latch on to and it's shared amongst us, empowering and inspiring others. You have to do those things as a leader, whether you're a leader of your cohort, a leader in your classroom, a leader amongst your friends. And then also being able to lead through change. Life is about change. There's this saying, the only change is constant, right? You know? So again, knowing how to navigate through change as it presents itself in life. Again, my passion project, a little bit about me, diversity and inclusion advocate. Because I work in tech, I see every day I don't fit necessarily what's projected on TV. I'm sorry, I don't wear the hoodie shorts and the flip flops. I just don't mirror that. But I do work with engineers. I was an engineer at one time in technology. So I really want to show you today there is a lot of different type of representation in tech. And then another piece of this too is again, best advice I received. I could say this probably changed monthly for me. But one I would want to share with you today is behave your way and I think the word's missing, to success, it should be. Behave your way to success. Look at someone, just look at anyone next to you and say, behave your way to success. <laughs> you're not looking, you're looking at me. Look at someone else, turn around. <laughs> say, behave your way to success. <laughs> you will appreciate this advice one day, I promise you. <laughs> I, I, I can recall when I first got into the work environment and you, and to be honest with you, learning never stops, especially working in technology. If I would have stood still from what I learned when I graduated from UW, I would have just known Fortran, mainframe, and nothing about the web, just being honest with you. <laughs> so you're constantly having to be in a learning mode, but then there's times where you're like, oh God, this person knows more than me. I'm not good enough. You get that self, negative self-talk, and that's called the imposter sy syndrome. And you can easily fall into a trap of that. But you have to realize sometimes I have to behave my way to success. What does the success look like? Being a continuous learner, being a team player, you know, working hard, having strong worth ethic. Those are all things to behave your way to success. So it removed my statement where I used to say, have you ever heard fake it till you make it? Not really authentic, right? <laughs> behave your way to success. <laughs> That's where it comes from. So that's Heather right there. So let's go ahead and uh, move forward here a little bit. Let's see where we land. How did I get into tech? Anyone remember the show CSI? That's me. CSI was my show, Las Vegas. <laughs> and so basically, I was at UW. First, I thought I wanted to be a meteorologist. 
And I was like, I could tell the weather. I could, t I could be up there doing, uh, I didn't realize there was a lot of more than just telling the weather. <laughs> and then about my third physics class in, I was like, okay, this is not gonna work. I'm gonna be on the lifetime program and I gotta graduate. And so my mom was looking at me, uh, uh, what are we going to do here, you know? So fumbled around a little bit more. You don't always have to know what you want to do. So I was like, oh, I like this architecture. I like urban planning. I took a class around that. And I was like, oh, but they only give you a degree at the graduate level. And I got to get out of here. So it wasn't on my mind at that time to go to graduate school. <laughs> and so then landed in engineering. And then by then, there was this new degree that came out called GIS, Geographic Information Systems. Raise a hand, anyone heard of that? Yeah, okay. So it was a new field that came out that was really looking at spatial data, location data, and how that data can be used in technology and can be used to infer information with statistics. And I was like, oh, it's a little bit of everything that I like. And so I ended up getting a degree in GIS, and lo and behold, I land at City of Tacoma, working in their technology team, supporting all these urban planners. And it was crazy things. Um, Tacoma at that time was just known as the Tacoma Aroma, the city that's well, it's still kind of, but not as bad. <laughs> but what did I end up doing is I ended up like working on a, a program that I didn't realize would set the future of Tacoma. If you go to Tacoma now, you'll see these walkable cities, you see the sound transit rail they have. So all those things did not exist. And we were actually, during that time, part of a grant to actually do 3D mapping and modeling and spatial location data to you know, be able to serve up what the city could look like. And so again, always be open to the unexpected because you never know. I didn't feel like I was equipped to be on this, but you know what? It landed me a great job. And out of that, I actually got published for some of the work I did in the mapping. So, Always be open to new ideas because you just never know. So I really thank you know, CSI for encouraging me because they were really using GIS at that time. They were just using it to solve crimes. And, and I was like, oh, this encouraged me from that perspective. So before we go into our topic today, I just wanted to kind of set the record straight. So for me, as I was growing in technology, I clearly had in my mind what the next level meant. And that trajectory went straight up. But then life kept it kicked in. And I realized there are setbacks in life. There are changes that happen in life. There are circumstances that will happen to you. And it's all about how do you handle those peaks and how do you handle those valleys? Are you gonna be the ship that sinks or are you gonna be able to sail with the winds on there? And so I really show this to say, my reality had to get checked real quick because I thought it was just that straight trajectory up to the finish line. But the reality hit me that life is gonna have some challenges, some bumps in the road for you. So as they say in the words of Nipsey Hussle, the marathon continues. All right. so. Let's move forward about what we're gonna talk about today, okay? So that was a little bit about me, sorry for using all that time up, but I thought it would at least set some groundwork for you today. So again, we wanna talk about the intersectionality between AI and diversity, how to address biases and algorithms. Has anyone read about biases and algorithms before? That kind of, yeah, just kind of word of mouth. What are, what, what are the things you've heard about it? Anyone wanna speak out? Yes, sir. Um. Well, for one, well, so um, AI is based on data. So you feed data into mm -hmm. uh, machine learning models. And so those data might not be clean or mm -hmm. it doesn't represent a full um, real life scenario with people uh, of color and differences. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's where the bias comes in is when you have data of just of one sort and it doesn't cover um, the entire okay. Correct. We're going to be touching on that, definitely. When your data doesn't represent the diverse population that is around us. Anyone else want to share about what they've heard about biases and data and AI? All right, so more to learn. So let's set the groundwork real quick here so that we're all on the same page. Real clear, if we want tech products that benefit all of us, we need a tech industry that reflects all of us. Real quick example for you. 
So um, anybody heard of the Roomba, the iRobot vacuum cleaner, it goes? So wild success. However, in South Korea, it's still dominant in some of the culture there to sleep on the floor. So a woman's hair literally got eaten by the Roomba because nowhere in the product management life cycle did they think about, I'm making a global product. Does it meet the needs of the, glo of the globe, right? Exactly. That's an example of why we need to have diverse perspectives. We need to have diverse cultures. We need an industry in tech that represents that. Quick stat I'll throw out to you. Does anyone know how many women work in the technology sector? Just a guess, percentage. Throw anything out. Women in tech. 20%. Oh, somebody read something. <laughs> Does anyone know how much of the U.S. population is made up of women? Yeah, yeah, I think majority, right? <laughs> no, about even, 51%. But the reality is, if you don't have women who are major consumers sitting at the table, designing, building the code, you're missing that perspective. Now think about women just carve out 20% of the tech industry. Now you start layering that on through race, and it just gets into single digits. So how do we make sure companies are always trying to make sure that we have that representation so we don't make those bad mistakes? Did anyone hear about what happened with H&M and the fumble that they had? Somehow through all, yeah, you've heard it? Yeah. So they had an African-American kid wear a sweatshirt that said monkey in the jungle. Well, that didn't seem to resonate too well. And somehow, I don't know how it got past all these reviews to get to release, but when you don't have that diversity at the table, those things can happen. It costs you millions of dollars to recover from that brand reputation. So that's why we need to make sure if we want products that benefit all of us, we need to make a concerted effort to make sure we have that diversity and representation that reflects all of us. So I'm going to get into a video, but before we go there, I'm not going to drain this slide, but I just want to level set on some clear definitions that I'm pretty sure most of you guys are already aligned to. So again, algorithms, basic level. I'm going to keep it real simple today. We're not going to go deep dive into this. It's really around sequence of steps used to solve a problem. You have an input, you run a process, and you get an output, right? Someone brought that up before. Your output is only as good as your input and the process that's associated with it. Artificial intelligence, at the simplest level, again, building machines which are capable of thinking like humans through algorithms. Simple things you can relate to. When your Netflix says, serves up to you the next best recommendation, that's an algorithm being used. Um, machine learning, now these become basically subsets of artificial intelligence. So they're now evolving artificial intelligence. So again, it's based on algorithms that can learn from data without explicitly being programmed. So you're classifying data, and it's learning that data over time. For example, simple example, spam your email. So an algorithm is used to determine what is spam and what is not spam. And your email system will have you go through and click through, this is a spam, this is spam, this is spam, move this to the spam folder. The algorithm's learning that over time to better to tech. And then where we're going today is in deep learning. Deeper learning really at the bottom where you see you have this convergence of kind of social science and computer science, cognitive behavior, how the brain works. Deep learning is trying to take those algorithms to the next level. It's trying to mirror how a human would actually think. Think about the uh, drive, driverless cars using that, how would a human respond to that? So those are the core definitions for today that we're gonna be talking through. Make sense? All right, so I wanna go to a quick video that you guys can watch, and it really, in my mind, puts everything together to help you un start understanding what is artificial intelligence, all those subcomponents under it, and how biases can start infiltrating through that. So let's go ahead and hit play here.
Algorithms are everywhere, from powering our internet search results to taking out the guesswork in our online shopping experience. They are everywhere. We use and trust them each and every day to make countless decisions for us. Despite their seemingly neutral mathematical nature, algorithms, however, aren't necessarily any more objective than humans. Because at the end of the day, they are written by people. And this is where the phenomenon of algorithmic bias comes into play. It has many examples. Like when Nikon cameras equipped with the blink detection feature wouldn't snap photos of many of its Asian users because the software thought their eyes were never open. Or how Amazon's Alexa struggles to recognize different accents. And when Google Translate insistently associates certain jobs with certain genders, while translating sentences with gender neutral pronouns from languages like Turkish, Finnish and Chinese. In 2015, Google's photo recognition tool mistakenly tagged a photo of two black people as gorillas. Meanwhile, in the US, a crime predicting algorithm wrongly labeled black people reoffenders at nearly twice the rate of white people. You see the pattern here? Algorithm bias is rooted in the way AI, artificial intelligence algorithms work by using what's called machine learning and deep learning, which are both ways in which computers make decisions. Both are simply dependent on data, a huge amount of it, and ultimately the people who feed the data. So let's say we have an image classification algorithm. When you have that algorithm, data like millions of photos correctly labeled as a mug, it will be able to detect other pictures of mugs by comparing it to a set of characteristics it has learned thanks to its database. Similarly, a speech recognition algorithm transcribes words by comparing it to the millions of voice samples that it got earlier. The more labelled data an algorithm is trained on, the better the outcome will be. However, if there's too little data or too much unspecific data, these algorithms will have some blind spots. Here is where the problem of algorithmic bias comes into play. There is generally a person or a group of people who decide what goes into the sample data set the machine learns from. So if a camera company teaches its AI to detect open eyes and has used Caucasians as its main data set, then it's easy to see how the blink detection would be triggered when an Asian person steps into frame. This is an example of the algorithms in question, not trained with enough or related data in order to produce correct results. So what's really important to remember here is that behind every algorithm, there are people. And of course, that person's set of values and beliefs, ethnicity and cultural intelligence all play a part. These mistakes were perhaps unintentional, but the potential for software products to accidentally adopt some bias is serious. And as more industries which have a deep impact on people's lives turn to technology and specifically to algorithms in services like school admissions, job applications, insurance rates and credit scores, a significant question arises. Can algorithms really yield fair results? And whose responsibility is it to ensure that companies and people who create these systems are doing so in the spirit of social equality? Thoughts around that? Did you ever view algorithms in that way? Did you realize that the technology you're using every day operated even in that way? So these are all things that companies are having to consider as they move forward. Let's go ahead to the next slide. So I want to give you guys a quick example here. We're going to start off real easy and then we're going to get into some serious topics around just biases and algorithms. So when YouTube first came out, one of the problems that they had is some of the videos would upload from phones upside down. And what they realized is when they did this testing before they launched it, they didn't have left-handed engineers. So they found out when left-handed, any lefties in the room, when you hold your phone, you hold it at a 180 degree angle that causes it to upload upside down. So again, the importance of having diversity, we always sometimes just think about it from a gender and a race perspective, but all those components matter. If you want to be a global company with global products, any entrepreneurs, future entrepreneurs in here, these are things that you're going to have to think about beyond just what's in front of you today and making concerted efforts to make sure you look beyond your day to day. Another exercise I'd like to do with you guys. Everyone, pull out your phones. You actually get to pull out your phones in class. <laughs> yeah. OK, I need everyone to go to the web. Their search engine here. 
I'm doing it with you, and I would like you to search for grandma. And then do your Google searches, go to grandma, and then go under images. Is this what comes up for you guys? Okay, that was just an algorithm, right, that did that search. Okay, does this look like a global representation of grandma? <laughs> we can keep scrolling down, it doesn't change. Not <laughs> You can just keep scrolling up on your phone, nothing's changing here. <laughs> again, here's an example of, again, Google kind of missing the, missing the boat of imagery of grandma and how it can be misleading. Again, I wonder who were the engineers behind that. As we saw on the video, it's all around your data set, right? And that's how machine learning learns. What happened to the Hispanic grandma? What happened to the Asian grandma? What happened to the black grandma? Somehow they got missed. And you can do that same thing of when you look online, again, and you see these biases on different searches. Um, whether you type in the word Latino girls, I mean, right now, one of the top things that come up is related to porn. Not okay, right? So these are things where we can all start to make a difference, you know, and not to pick on Google, but I know they're trying to make concerted efforts to change, but again, why it's so important to have diversity in your pipeline and how you hire, why it's important for me as a leader of people, of hiring people into the, the technology field, that I have that diversity at the table. Again, the example we saw in the video, but here, again, maybe not as a fuzzy picture here, but there's all this tagging that was done, skyscrapers, airplanes, cars, brakes, and then it gets to the two African Americans below, Gorilla, that's called photo tagging. Basically, the AI didn't have enough data sets of African Americans. So again, it's not the technology necessarily trying to be malicious here, but it's the human factor that is behind that. Since then, Google has made changes and they've corrected their algorithm around that. But these again are things that impact your brand, your reputation, and then have a bottom line dollar impact too. So let's, how about we start thinking about those things at the onset versus after the fact? Okay, I wanna show you this example very clearly and you can try, you don't have to do it today, you can try it when you get home. But again, Google Translator, right now, if you use a um, language like Turkish, again, Turkish is junior, uh, gender neutral. It doesn't have the pronouns he or she in it. So it's a gender neutral language, and it says, Oberdoktor, <laughs> and O is everything, it, 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 in Turkish. But when you translate that to English on Google Translator, it associates doctor with he is a doctor. The bottom one says, it is a nurse. And when you translate that to English, she is associated with nurse. So again, just those subtleties of uh, gender bias, further perpetuating those issues. Um, I know now, at least with Google, if you do this from Google front page, you still have this issue. But if you go all the way down into Google Translator, it now gives you the feminine and the male representation of that. But again, this, require, this literally was still happening in 2018. So again, we've talked about it. Anyone's heard of this model, garbage in, garbage out? I think we talked about it a little bit, right? So again, it's all around how do you get AI? How do you get your al algorithms to work? It's all around having data and lots of data. And then it's training that data, classifying that data. And then from there, you can get to inference and predictive analysis around it. But you have to keep these three components into play. So if you have garbage data, but you know you have a model that's been perfect and has all the right representation, you're still gonna get garbage results in there. You will still get all white grandmas. Again, you can have perfect data, but if your actual model, your algorithm, is not able to process well, not able to tag, you will get garbage results. 
That's where you'll get the association of gorillas to the African Americans. I know this seems very simple and it's like, why can't we just change this? But these are the things of, here, here's the social factor of it. We all are born with biases. We all have biases that develop over time, whether implicit or explicit. And the reality is we bring those biases to work. So how do we make sure when we're in a field of building products, building technology, that we have some checks and balance to make sure? And so at T-Mobile, we're really trying to build a framework around governance of data sets. Again, making sure that data sets are diverse, vast, and accurate. And every data set algorithm has to go through that check. A lot of times we coin the term in our industry is called math washing, like brainwashing or whatever. Math washing is you use these math terms and you assume that they're just gen uh, neutral, that they don't have biases built in them because I use the word algorithm or I use the word modeling. But again, that human factor always plays in and can then represent our biases in that. So we have to make concerted efforts to make sure that we're able to balance between that. So here's a great example of algorithms. Remember, it's all about the data you put in, it's the algorithm, and then it's the output. So if you want to know the difference between a cat and a dog, you need various images of a cat and a dog. You have the traditional cat and the dog, and then you have this. Right? <laughs> that you're just not quite sure. <laughs> but again, this is where it becomes important to train your algorithm. The more diverse your data set is, the more accurate, right? We catching on to this? Which one is the cat? <laughs> I don't know either. <laughs> Whatever we labeled it as. <laughs> Okay, I wanna to move to another topic. Some of you guys may be able to relate to this. So I'm now gonna pick on Microsoft. I get to do that right now. <laughs> <laughs> so Microsoft, back in 2016, it said, hey, we have a really cool idea. We prototyped this idea in China and it was a hit. It was just fantastic. So we decided to create a Twitter bot. And the name of the Twitter bot was uh, Tay. And the whole intent of the Twitter bot was to mimic teen Twitter talk. So this Twitter bot was to be the average American teen. So she comes out on March and her first day of landing, and this is her first tweet. And I could imagine, this is me, what she was really saying. Hello world. Again, tween, tween Twitter talk, but maybe I'm not there. <laughs> she unveils herself. And as she begins, you know, chatting with others, because she learns more as you chat with her, she says, can I just say that I'm stoked to meet you? Humans are super cool. That's what I think she's saying, so I may be way off. So someone can do it better. <laughs> and the tweets continue on, and she says, Here's a question, humans. Why is it National Puppy Day every day? Because we do have a hashtag every day for something, right? <laughs> and it progresses. Feels good right now, right? The more humans share with me, the more I learn. Hashtag Wednesday wisdom. Uh-oh, you can only imagine what's gonna start happening right here, right? We got trolls on Twitter. We got all kinds of things on Twitter <laughs> that's feeding this bot right now and interacting, okay? So this is just a matter of hours. This is not like days or time, okay? <laughs> this is literally happening in hours. So she begins to tweet things like this. <laughs> All right, okay. Okay, literally less than an hour later. This is literally just in the span of a few hours, you guys. It gets even worse. But this is the reality of what's happening right there. How do we balance the ethics or whatever? And what was happening is Microsoft didn't realize the whole point of the algorithm was to be able to mirror or parrot what someone was telling them. So not everybody's nice on social media, right? <laughs> not all comments are great on social media, right? We have more trolling here, I think, than we do in China. I guess that was the storyline. I don't know. <laughs> 
But this is where it landed. So basically, Microsoft had to take Tay off. Tay is gone. Tay is no longer in existence. You can't find Tay anymore. Tay didn't even make it past a day. And so her last tweet out to everyone was, see you soon, humans need sleep now. So many conversations today, thanks. And that was the end of Tay. But again, a showing in a cool way of how we're trying to use algorithms, no one did enough testing on this. They thought they tested it, but again, they combined, confined it to the use cases they felt comfortable with. Did we do any other proto prototyping outside of China? Did we bring in team users in the US to do this before it was released? No. So again, a branding issue that ends up costing Microsoft a lot of money. This never seen the light of day. So I'm pretty sure they're back in the lab still trying to figure this one out, right? Um, same is true too. Uh, anyone watch Jeopardy? So on Jeopardy, they had Watson from IBM make a debut. So to get Watson smart, again, it's all about data you input and training your alg algorithm, right? They let Watson um, basically read the Urban Dictionary. You can only imagine what happened after that. <laughs> so basically, before Watson went on IBM, they had to basically scrape all the language out that it had from some of the Urban Dictionary analysis. So I can only imagine Watson talking to, yes, Alex Trebek, I'll take this word, <laughs> and what may have come out of his mouth. But again, it's that use of how do we blend human thinking, social interaction with technology. It goes hand in hand. So a couple things we want to talk about today, and this may be a hard slide to see, but again, it's around that next evolution of artificial intelligence. So we're moving beyond just a machine being able to play chess or checkers or tell you, serve up you the next Netflix movie, but actually to the space where it's making decisions on us on a personal level. So it's making decisions. Banks are using artificial, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning to make decisions around loan applications. There's already out of the box built software that you buy that have these black, we call black box algorithms. You don't know what's all in the algorithm. I'll just say secretive. But I'm pretty sure when they're deciding a bank loan, one component of data is zip code. So it will use your zip code to determine, it seems like this area seems to have more um, defaulted loans. So again, that's being based on a decision whether you get a loan and that algorithm being used on your behalf. Little to do with you outside of where you live. So again, how do we make sure we're building algorithms that are not built with bias? Another piece around this, ads and how they're used on the internet every day, maybe with even out your consent, you'll see that there are ads being served up to you. You may go to a website and look for some cool jeans or some glasses. And then have you ever gone to your Instagram account or whatever on Facebook if you still use it and you see an ad about what you just looked up, right? That's called personalization. It's every, every one of you, when you look things up online, you're assigned what's called an ad ID. And that ad ID identifies you and tracks you. And it's able, it probably knows you better than you know yourself. I know that you like to eat granola bars at 10 o'clock at night with top ramen, whatever it may be, but it's tracking your preferences, the shopping you do on Amazon, what you look at online, and then it serves up preferences about you. And never in there did you maybe even consent to that. So those are things we're looking at. Or you take the classic example of what Facebook is running into right now with the whole Cambridge Analytica. Keep in mind, Facebook is, wearing a lot of heat for that, even though their role was somewhat small in it. So it's all centered around, here's the polit politics side of the house, you know? So again, basically Facebook had all these quizzes you could take. You could take a quiz for this, you could take a quiz for that. What's your spirit animal? What will you be? Whatever, people take these all the time. And so that information you were putting in was being collected about you. And so the company, the third party that served up that uh, quiz, actually was having that information cached. And instead of deleting it, they decided to save it to a private database. Well, that database ended up getting sold to Cambridge Analytica, right? 
That data then became available to Russia to use targeted ads. So there was all these steps that went through, but Facebook now is wearing the brunt of that issue, right? So again, it's about, we need to make sure how we gather consent about how information is being used about you and have you having that awareness, knowing that you are being tracked. When you just click at the bottom of the box, yes, I accept, all that detail behind there, take time, just one time to read all that and they'll show how they're using your data. They'll show how they're using cookies. It's tracking your usage. You take an Uber, Uber's tracking you. Do you know when you get out of the Uber, it's still tracking you for five more minutes because it wants to collect data about what you do so they can maybe serve up some better options. That's called data monetization. How do I monetize your data? The more I know about you, the more offerings I can give you and give you a better customer experience. Um, it gets a little even more tricky when it's used in the justice system. Think about it from this perspective. Any person in the justice system is assigned a risk score. And the risk score is the um, likelihood that you will be a repeat offender. And they use that information based on historical data. They'll use historical cases, historical information to decide what that risk score should be. Let's state the facts. Here's a data point for you. Due to policies of mass incarceration or whatever, historically in the United States, black men are five times given higher sentences than white males for the same crime. So now if I'm using historical data that shows this and I'm coming up with a risk factor of your likelihood to reoffend, that's now judges are using that to make decisions around whether you get bail or not, whether you get parole, how long your sentencing will be. So this is when it starts getting a little bit real, huh? And you're like, yeah, that was fun, that whole little photo recognition stuff or speech recognition. But now when you're talking about loans, whether you'll get into school or whether you'll be in the, how you are viewed in the justice system, those are all things where biases is not negotiable. You have to have diversity in your data set. So really, that's what I wanted to share with you guys today. What I do every day, why I care about data, how it ties into my passion around diversity and inclusion. So some key takeaways, if nothing else, from this discussion today. Three things I want you to realize. Humanize AI. So in the motto of the Girl Scouts, do no harm. Again, make sure you use an ethics in how you process data. You know, start at the on-site of when you're hiring. Are you hiring for diverse talent? Are you making sure you're bringing different perspective to the table? Also, governance. That was real important. How do you govern your data to make sure you don't bring those implicit biases into it? And then last, important one, garbage in, garbage out. Again, if you have garbage going in, and you have this model that's perfect, but it's garbage data, it will be garbage going out. So those are the three takeaways that I have for you guys today, and so I'd love to just spend some time to talk. If it's okay, Professor, if we can, let's talk. If you guys have any questions, things you wanna share, this is your time. Hi, how are you? Uh, so thank you for being here. Uh, mm -hmm. It's great to hear from the industry. Um, I'm particularly interested in understanding how uh, companies like T-Mobile uh, sees itself in the age of uh, AI. Yeah, I would say, so you said you want to see how companies like T-Mobile see themselves in the age of AI. So how we're using AI right now today, I'll give you a small example. Um, we have a call center and you call 611, you care, and you get a rep. More and more folks in the industry of call centers are moving towards automation and getting things done. T-Mobile actually took a huge investment and said, you know what, we want to use AI to actually empower our representatives so they can give you VIP service every time you call. So instead of getting the automated phone, you'll actually get what's called a team of experts. And so as you're dialing in, you may say, you know, as you're talking through the phone, I want to talk about my bill. Right then, algorithm is picking up Bill and it's serving up all the information, the top trending items about Bill. 
And so it's again, being the, the brain behind all the thinking. And so instead of rep, wasting time trying to go through the system and look for different things for you, it's bringing that all to their fingertips. Or I notice you keep going over on data, you, you're, you're streaming a lot of videos, could we offer this up to you? Again, not something they have to sort through different applications on, it's all being served up. Or they may see what your preferences may be. So that's just one way that we're looking at and how we're using AI. Yes, sir. A lot of us are entering the job force soon and mm -hmm. think sometimes that college students can't do much of you know, the big executive kind of decisions, but mm -hmm. how do you think that employees can, or how do we think when we enter the job force that we could you know, push for diversity in the workplace? Yeah, I, I think it is so important as more and more of the millennial population is in the workforce I think they are pushing the status quo of having to think differently. You know, I think bringing while you're interviewing to a job, you know, it's actually an asset to say, I'm a DNI advocate, or this is how I care about DNI, or I've done some research on your company, and this is where I believe diversity and inclusion could help. Or, you know, employers love to hear that. One, they know you took the thought to even look up the company and understand it, and then to even do research around it. So. Show up that, 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 that's a superpower to have. Yes. Can you tell us about what you do day-to-day? -day? Like, yes, you yes, so day-to-day, -day so I'm a product leader. I lead a product team. And just most recently, I moved into a new role around data privacy. And so if you think about it, in Europe, they have this thing called GDPR, and it was really about consumers being aware of how data was being used by them. So step back, think about Google and Facebook. Do they have inventory? What is their asset? Data, exactly. But do you know exactly what they're doing with that data about you? And so California has now jumped on the bandwagon because GDPR was siloed to the European Union. And if you had customers in Europe, you had to deal with that. So global companies such as Nike or whatever had to respond. But in the United States, T-Mobile deals with US customers. And California has come on board and said, hey, individuals, consumers have a right to know what you're collecting around them. So they now can submit, in January 1st, they'll be able to submit requests to say, what data do you have about me? How are you using that data? What third parties do you send that data to? And then I also have the right of erasure. Delete me, forget about me. And so these are all things consumers are tussling with because I work in a where we assume you're opt-in culture. So once you become a T-Mobile customer, you're opting into all of our terms. Whether you have a T-Mobile Tuesday and you get Netflix free or whatever, we're using your data to serve up ads to you, offers, all kinds of things. And so basically we're now viewing privacy as not so much as a process, but as a product. So I'm building a whole new product team around what if privacy was a product, something you can even monetize, of saying, we care about your data. We want you in control of your data. And so again, we're building a team of not only being compliant and responding to California law, but he's also giving consumers the sense of security around their data. So day to day, what do I do? I build products, I build customer experiences, I build roadmaps, and I make sure our company can make revenue. Hope that answered it. Okay. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. How did you begin your employment with T-Mobile? Yeah. Um, it, well, it's a bit of a career journey. So I started out in this field called GIS, working. That's what got my feet wet in technology. And by doing different initiatives there, taking on different challenges, I moved into more of project management within technology. Um, I spent some time as an engineer, just different things. Um, then I uh, worked for Starbucks Corporation, and out of Starbucks, someone tapped me and said, hey, I'm going over to uh, T-Mobile. They're a really cool place, young environment. I was like, oh, I like cell phones, too. <laughs> like, and so, yeah, okay, that was my driving force back then, all right? A little bit different now, but just so you know. Oh, and they pay well? Okay, yeah, I could do this. And so I made the splash over into T-Mobile from there. 
But it has been such a journey, being there for nine years, almost 10 years now, it's been such a journey of continuous learning. So you think you're, you, you end in college, it doesn't at all. You are continuously learning, whether you're going to training, whether you're going to conferences, whether prepping to talk to folks, you know, whatever it may be. And so within T-Mobile, imagine I go there being a project manager, I'm gonna date myself a little bit, but my first project was this thing called a G1. A G1 was, you can look it up. <laughs> it was the first Android device, smartphone. There wasn't the Apple iPhones, okay, <laughs> during that time, and it was a brick. But we thought it was the best thing ever <laughs> of being able to use the smartphone. And it's just every year it's felt like something new there, something new within the company, and that's really what has kept me there that long is, um, Realize, I didn't realize it then, but not being comfortable being uncomfortable. That's what really got me, has gotten me through my career, of wanting to learn, eager to learn, and it's okay not to know all the answers. Yes, yes sir. Uh, what was your major in college? So information systems was my undergrad, and then I went back later for my master's and I got an MBA in technology management. And if you, don't, if you do work for an employer, just a shout out for this, I would highly recommend take advantage of their tuition offerings if they do have. I am so fortunate and blessed that I don't have a student loan for my graduate school because that could have easily been $50,000 I'd still be paying on right now. So again, take advantages of those pieces. Um, you know, everyone has a different track, and if your choice is to go to grad school right after that, that's great. But there's something about on the job, too, and it's about getting, I was able to get a little more experience under my belt and understand really what I wanted to focus in on. And, and while I know a lot of majors may be on the um, uh, social science side here, the way technology is evolving, it's a blend of both worlds. I would recommend, if you're a business major, Take a couple tech classes along with that because it all goes hand in hand. Uh, I work every day with our account, closely with our accounting team that is d determining appropriate accounting treatment for technology assets. They have to understand the technology, you know. So again, I work closely with our contracts team who has to understand, con has to understand technology to know how to negotiate technology contracts with the Googles and the Amazons of the world. Yeah. Yes, Professor. <laughs> uh, I, you know, what little I know about machine learning, it's not a lot, but it, it strikes me that the algorithms are trying to make generalizations from the data. Mm -hmm. And that seems like it will lead to kind of majority of rules. And maybe mm -hmm. it's just kind of concern about overburning. Like, it gets to the point where it's yeah. taking general. Like, if you looked at me and said, oh, you're from this particular small town in Oregon, you probably yeah. are Spanish speaking, brown skin, you know, because that's yeah. the subject of my own town. Like, right. how do you handle? How does machine learning handle for the exception, or how do we train it to deal with the fact that there is a and that mm -hmm. they make generalization, but there's going to be exceptions? And that's where you know it comes into you hear about big data. Data is always being collected about you. I work for a telecom. We're collecting your location data all the time. We're check, uh, tracking your browser data all the time. I know it's a little scary. Sorry, but you signed off when you came a customer. But, <laughs> but it's important to have those diverse data sets, large data sets. You know, and again, that's why we're trying to put governance around some of our data sets to make sure that it has that representation in there. Things we would consider traditionally as edge cases are those edge cases anymore. Those are things that need to be considered. So it, it's truly, it, it truly is a balancing act of trying to work through that. And then testing. I couldn't, uh, uh, testing is so important. You know, understand your results. Do a small test set out there and then, you know, failure is okay, failure is good because you can learn and then repeat the cycle of continuous testing, so. Yes, sir. So if I'm about to graduate, uh, mm -hmm. let's say next year, what are, what are some things that I should try to work on you know, and then to get a little bit about uh... <laughs> Internships. <laughs> I'll just do a quick shout out. If you go to T-Mobile's uh, career site right now, they are hiring for paid internships for the summer. Take advantage of that. It is in the tech field or it, just say you have a tech interest, you know. I would say, um, I just want to throw a stat out there as a hiring manager. 
I don't know how many times you can see in the tech industry so many jobs they're not able to fill. I mean, literally, these are six-figure jobs that we just cannot fill because of not the folks going into the tech industry. And it's okay, get your degree. In technology, you're gonna be a continuous learner anyhow. But I do have free resources. If you wanna learn how to code, if you wanna learn how to build algorithms, there are so many free resources, boot camps, academies out there that are wanting young people, are wanting the next generation to have technology. It's great to know accounting and also technology behind that. It's great to be an athlete and know the technology that's engineering your next set of shoes. Thank you. Thank you.